Okay, in this video, we're actually going to build a cascading dropdown from a SharePoint list of about 1,200 items. And then we're going to go over, very briefly, over the anatomy of a data car and setting a custom validation method. Okay, so in this video, we're actually going to start talking about uh, building our making model as a cascading dropdown. And what we have here on the screen, if you take a look at the car models list, we actually went out to, uh, I want to say Kelly Blue Book website and found this list that was in the grid format that actually has all the makes and the related models. And if you look at the size of this list, this list is going to be, I think it's like 1,200 combinations. So there's actually 1,237 models of various vehicles. So in our parking lot request form, what we want to do is grow this to where they don't have to, the user doesn't have to type in a name and then type in a model and have variations because it's all free text and we want to lock that in in some way. So let's take a look at our Power Apps. So in order to do that, what this form is going to have to do is going to actually have to start to interact with multiple data sources. So you have the one data source. Oh, let's see if this is going to open. Hold on. Sorry, I have the, some of this already open. Okay. So you have one data source that's actually looking at the list and handling all the requests. And then the second data source will be this car models here that would kind of give us all the makes and the models. And we want that to come in at, in a cascading way. And when we say cascading, we mean that they select the, the make first and then from that, the selected make, all the models related to that make will, uh, will be available in options. So the first thing we want to do is go ahead and bring the data source into our Power App. So let me just go here in the data source, search on the connection type, and then use that service account and here under the request, uh, equipment request site, here are all my lists that I have. So I'm going to select the first one, which is car models. And then from there, what I want to do is go back into the form. And I want to take advantage of the existing data cards or site columns that I have. Now, I obviously these have to be drop downs, but I don't necessarily have to change the type of where I'm storing the data as a drop down because, or a choice column because all I'm going to do is store the selected option. But I do want to take advantage of this data card because of the required fields and it's already wired up to save uh, the, these values right there on the site column itself. So in order to do that, I'm going to just go into this data card and add in a drop down control. So if I go to the input type and then drop down, and then you would notice I'm going to select drop down versus combo because I don't really need the search capabilities that a combo box uh, provides me, nor do I need the template within combo boxes to where I can show more than one data element at a time. So I just want to store, you know, show the single data element. So I have my drop down here. And what I want to do is go right here to the data card value, the control that used to show that shows by default and go ahead and turn that off. So I set the visibility off for that. And I'm going to do the same thing for models. So I go into models, go into the input type, drop in my, my drop down uh, control, resize it. And what I'm trying to do is resize it right there on top of the text field because I want it to really kind of feel natural and not, you know, fill out a place at all. So here on the models, again, I just select the data card, the one that's displayed by default. Go ahead and hide this guy. And now what I want to do, all of my drop down, all my controls I use in um, formulas, I always rename these, right? So for this one, I'm going to prefix it as DD for drop down and then call it models, plural, because there's some, several models there. And then for the data card value, the one that represents the site column that's going to hold the value here, I'm going to rename this to V model singular because there's only going to be one value and one value only. And I'm going to do the exact same thing here. So DD makes and it could be manufacturers, but 
and then V make, right? Because we always call it, you know, make and model, right? When you're talking about vehicles. So, okay, so here, uh, let's go ahead and wire up make. So this is the first one that they have to uh, select and we want them to select the actual make. So let's look at our list again. And like I said, I have uh, it's over 1200 here. So all the makes are in this column and all the models are there. And there's a lot of repeat, right? Because for every make, um, there is uh, for every model, there's a coincide make and you have makes that have many different models and we understand how cars work, right? So here, um, I want to make a reference to car models, data source, but I want unique values, right? So the first thing I want to do, they have this special function called distinct. And what that's going to do is going to take all the uh, values in this column in the make column and only return a single instance of each one which uh, is going to give you distinct and with that distinct you have to have a special property called results uh, in order to to see that now I run into this um, pretty frequently to where this things kind of get locked up and it actually does not show me the results the actual drop items in the drop down um, Let's see, sometimes you have to play around with it a little bit for it to kind of kick in. Uh, let's see here. All right, hold on, let's let's try this. So let's just do the entire data source. And this is a uh, Power App Studio issue. This is nothing to do with the drop down as well at all. All right, so here, if I select everything, and this is what we do not want, right? We do not want all these repeats here. We only want a single instance. So now that I have this wired up, now let me try my distinct. And if you run into something similar, actually all you have to do is uh, just save it and push it up and it, it will actually work once it's up there in the uh, in SharePoint. So uh, the results, let's see if this thing wires up now. Still not playing nice. Okay, so let's just go ahead and move forward. So now uh, I have my distinct values there. We just trust that it's doing what it needs to do, and we can push it up to confirm. And now what we want to do is for this model drop down under its items, we only want to show the related models for the selected make. So to do that, you do a filter on the same data source called models, but this time we only want to show models where the make is equal to the selected make so this is my drop down this is again this is why renaming is key because i know any drop down control is going to have the dd in front of it and i know how to go after which properties are needed right so in this case it's going to be the selected make uh, dot value which is going to give us the text value that represents the selected value and from there it's going to return everything but I only want to show the model property, right? So here, still, it's not going to do anything. So let's let's go ahead and push this up. And I may have to reset Power Studio. So let's just see Power App Studio. So let's just see how far we can get um, with the selected, with the current state. So let me go to I'm in parking lot request here. Do a Control F5. Go into here. Everything's loaded, hit edit. Um, I still have my text boxes, so let me do control F5 again. Usually if you do control F5 in edit mode, it uh, seems to kick in. All right, so here, as promised, um, here's my unique values of makes. And if I select BMW, these are all the BMWs. If I select Dodge, these are all the Dodge models, right? So now if I select this and hit say, all right, let's, let's play with the first one. I kind of lost which one I was heading. Now if I select Buick and then uh, Regal for 5654-565, you would notice that, let's slide my making model over here. You will notice the value is not saving because we have work to do. So at least I have my drop down working, right? So my drop down is working, my cascading is working as expected. So now what I need to do is save the actual selected value. So in order to do that, 
what you want to do is this is where you kind of leverage those uh, default uh, uh, controls, the single line text controls that represents the site column. And that's why we did not delete these out. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just take this whole uh, make and set the default value instead of parent. I'm going to set it to my DD makes selected text dot value. So whatever is selected, that's who I want to store that in. And I'm going to do the exact same here. So whatever is selected for DD models, just store that into that text box control. All right. So let's just save this up, push it up. And I'm walking you through all the steps. Like we could have went in and wired everything up under a single session, but you know, as you're kind of working through your scenarios and you see how, okay, the cascade's working, but it's not saving, you know, you kind of know how to solve that. And that's why I'm kind of taking this one step at a time. All right, so I think I got my refreshes in. I think I have enough in there now. So let me hit Chevy and then Camaro and then save that all. Still nothing, hit that five again. And that's the thing, like when you think you're, I guess when you know you're right, you can't think when you know you're right, you just keep going through your refreshes until you see the results that you're expecting. All right, so let's go ahead and do the Bentley and let's do the Brooklyn. There you go. So now it's saved. So now if I go to this one here, hit edit, Acura RSX, and those are saved. And it's just pushing the latest modified to the top, which is fine. All right, so now this is saving. So now we have that, but we have another issue. So the other issue is that I have Acura here. I'm going to edit this guy. Acura CL is popping up as my default. So the one that's saved is not popping up as the default. Actually, Acura CL is popping up for all of them as the default. And the problem with that is, is that if I just edit and save it, it's going to take that default value and inadvertently override the, the real value that I had under underneath it. So what we have to do now is to wire up the default value for these drop downs. Now, in order to do that, uh, when we view the form, we're actually looking at the drop down, right? Because our uh, text boxes are still hidden in the back. We're not the user would never interact with those directly. They're only interacting with these text box with the drop downs. So what we want to do is just go to the default of the drop down, and when you drop these controls on, you get this default one in uh, in double quotes. You actually want this to be the parent dot default, and the reason why it's parent dot default. It's because uh, when it's new, the drop down is going to make a selection. These are going to be empty. But as soon as they make a selection, they're going to store the value here. Then the value uh, in this control is actually saved to the data card, which actually saves it to the site column. And in edit mode or in view mode, what it's doing is going to read from the data card to, to view the save value right here in these controls. So that's the cycle, right? So you have a new cycle, then you have an edit or update cycle, and then you have a view, which is a read only cycle once it's created. So once this guy is created, we want it to default to parent.value. And for new items, this is going to be empty and it's just going to be because they have to select it anyway. So they're just going to select it from the drop down. So uh, parent.default is the magic value. And the reason, and that's why it's parent.default because you actually want to read from the site column on the list. Okay. Now, if that, you know, just play this over again if, if that does not make sense and then just digest it. All right, so here for my other models, it's the same syntax, even though it's a different value. We're just going to take the parent that's in the data card and store it as the default. All right, so save that off. And that's the thing, like with those data cards, uh, understanding the anatomy of the data card. And I mean, we'll talk about how you can customize the um, the error messages too, uh, because understanding the anatomy of the data card is everything. And it's one of those things that we always look over because it does so much for us. And until you need to customize something, you really don't really have to interact or understand how those data cards are working. Okay. All right, so here, let's look at Acura RSX. There we go. And if I look at this one, now notice what happens here. 
so here I have, this is when I was free texting or free handing everything. I have my ADSA and then my DSA. Those are not valid uh, values in that drop down, right? To make it a default. So it's just gonna select the first one because they couldn't find a match. So here, let me hit Chevy and then Capri Classic. And that's that. So now if I click on this guy, that's good. If I click on this guy, that's good. Click on the selected one, that's good. So everything's matching up to the actual store value and making those a default. Okay, so now what we want to do, if you take a look at this guy, you'll notice how there's no bounding boxes on these other controls. And for the two drop down controls that I dropped in, those are the only ones that seem to have these bounding boxes in view mode. When we're in edit mode, we expect them because it helps highlight the field that needs to be, you know, adjusted or modified to handle the data. But in read only mode, we we want again, we want we hijacked this data card and we injected some custom controls, but we still want it to look natural like all the other controls that you get by default when you're interacting with data cards. So in order to handle that, what's happening with these uh, controls that we dropped in, if you look at the display mode, the display mode is defaulting to edit and it's not being, and understand like this display mode goes through different cycles depending on what you're trying to do with the form. So if you're in new, uh, if creating a new item, this display mode should be new. Uh, if you're just viewing the item, this display mode should be view. So instead of, and we don't have to come in here and modify all of that logic to look at. The only thing we have to do is uh, take a look at the parent dot display mode because this data card again this is one of the benefits of using the data card because the data card is going to already have it's already going to be wired up to change this display mode based on what the form is doing so again it's just one of those things that you take advantage of if you uh, wire these up correctly and again I'm gonna just go here uh, change the display mode for the model to parent dot display mode I've already done that for the make and then the other thing is, and you know, I, well, let me show you. Again, I don't, I don't want to make too many changes, and um, we not take a look at why we're making a change. Okay, so this is going to work. You know, if I hit refresh several times, see how many refreshes this is going to take for this thing to kick in. Usually, if I go to edit mode and hit refresh, that usually does the trick. Let's see. All right, so now we're here, right? And the bounding boxes are gone for view mode and if I go into edit mode the bounding boxes are back which is it to be expected but notice one thing and this is this may just be me being picky you will notice that the padding is more for my drop down values than it is for all the other values right so I, I want to sync those up like I just I, I, again I want all of this to kind of look natural and not my drop downs my custom drop downs to stick out I want it to feel natural to the user. So here, what I would do, by some odd reason, uh, drop downs when you drop them in, they default to uh, 12 pixel padding. Let's just go ahead and adjust this down to five. And I know it's five because I looked at one of the other drop downs and I noticed that uh, they have five. They actually have a formula to to determine the padding. Um, but for us, you know, we don't need a formula. We just hard code it to five. All right, so that's going to handle that piece. All right, so I talked about uh, understanding the data card. So let's look at uh, the anatomy of the data card in a sense of how do you customize these error messages. So what do I mean? So if I come in here and create a new item, and if I just arbitrarily hit save, I get this generic message that says an entry is required. But basically, sometimes you deal with clients or users and they say, hey, can you make that error message to be more descriptive and say exactly what's missing? It's kind of descriptive, right? You have the error here and the bounding box is highlighted. So you, for the end user, for the most part, they understand what's missing. But here, they okay, say if they, example, you have a requirement to where you actually want to specify or customize this error. So to do that, uh, let's just pick on batch number as an example here's your error message here so so your data card is going to have the star that's the asterisk and that appears when it's required and then this is the error message that gets displayed when 
they try to save and they don't populate the required field. So let me unlock this, highlight this label, and then come up here and uh, just change parent.error to whatever we want to call it. Now, my first reaction is going to be, oh, let me just drop the text here. And it says, please enter batch number. All right? And that can be my error. But the problem is, is that this guy is always displayed. Even if, even if there's not a, a, a validation error, it's always displayed. So what's happening is that they always display, the, the label is always open, it's always visible, uh, but the parent.error only has a value when there's an error. So you can, you can leverage that logic. So if it only has a value when there's an error, we can build a test that says uh, is blank. So let's do a is blank test against that parent.error property. Right. So if it's actually if it's not blank, meaning that it's populated, show this error. Else uh, don't show anything, which is what it was doing in the first place. Right. So let me save this off, push this up and it just really easy as that. That's how you customize your error messages. Now, I think one of the one of the uh, the drawbacks with power apps and validation errors, and I'm sure they probably grow into this, is that um, you may have other validations that you want to control. Like, um, say for example, this has to be a certain number of digits, right? And if it's less than that, so we can build formulas to say, yeah, it's less than that, but we can't, I uh, unless you know how, I don't know how, but I couldn't figure out how to stop the save event right because it seems like the only thing that stops the save event if it's um if you have it flagged as required and it's not there's no value but if you wanted to do additional validation like oh i need this to be a certain number of digits or the max i know how to do but like it has to be between three and eight or numbers only that we know how to do, but you know, it's just other things like date ranges, for example. Like if I had a start date and end date, and you put in the end date that's greater than the start, that's uh, less than the start date, where it doesn't make sense, right? Those types of validations, you can't stop the user from submitting. But if you know how to do that, please let me know. Um, those are some of the validation pieces that I couldn't figure out. All right, so. There, there's our custom validation error um, message for required fields only. There's our cascading drop down. And oh, one last thing. If you look at this real quick, if you look if you look at this drop down here for makes, you will notice it stops at GMC. Now if I look at the actual list, I have this goes all the way down to Volvo, like all the way to the V's, right? Like we're building this for the Tesla parking lot and you can't even see Tesla. And the reason for that is because by default, when uh, power apps look at any data source, oh my goodness, what did I do? Okay, that was scary. When power apps looks, looks at any data source, it's gonna cap out for performance reasons at 500 items. Now I can go in here and adjust this out to like 2000, but in reality is that the SharePoint list, these data sources are really built to handle millions and millions of records. SharePoint list, for as an example, can is built to hold 30 million records before it actually starts to fall apart. And I understand that, you know, the 5,000 threshold, 5,000 threshold is always a big deal. So, so, um, so to get around that, uh, and it only applies to my unique values because I don't have any maker that has more than 500 models. So for the model piece, I'm not too concerned with. But when building out my um, make dropdown, I need to see every option in the list. Let me just refresh this to get rid of those X's. I need to see every option in the list um, in order to determine Oh my goodness, what did I do? All right, so in order to 
in order to get the full list, I need to see everything in the list, right? To, in order to get my distinct list of items. So I, I can't really read that be, So uh, to do that. So long story short, there's no way to get around that without upping the count. And I don't like that, right? Because that means it was set for 500 for a reason. So things can be snappy. You can read these data sources only take 500 at a time. So it's, it's doing that from performance reasons. And I don't want to overwrite that, right? I don't want to make this app slow just because I need to read all 1200 items in this list. So what I've done, I, I pulled, uh, I used some uh, Excel magic, uh, grabbed all these items, did a distinct uh, selector on this column and had and got a distinct list. And then what I did is I, you know, there's many ways you can solve this, but for me, instead of creating another list that only have makes in there, and then that's another list in that you add to your solution and your footprint, I just added this choice column and dumped all those unique values of the make inside of this choice column. And the choice column is called make options. So now what I can do for my make dropdown, instead of using distinct on the entire list of 1200, I can now just go and say, you know what, all my distinct values are in that choice column. So let me use the choices um, method, select to this data source and tell it to look at make options. Uh, make options as my choice, wait choices oh sorry it's data source dot this is a syntax thing make options there we go so you do your data source dot and then the column name and because it's a choices column or choice column type this choices method will extract all those options from that column and then voila i have my whole entire unique list. And I love this solution too, right? Because it's not like these are hard coded, which is something you don't want to do. What in the world is going on? What did I do? All right, so I changed that data source to this formula. And for some odd reason, it's not allowing me to save it. I, I clicked on something before this and it screwed everything up. So let, let me just do the long way. All right. So, but really that's the end. I think that's the, the big takeaway. The big takeaway is, is that understand that when you're dealing with data sources, it's only going to look at 500 at a time. You got to get crafty to make sure that you have the right formulas in there to where you can deal with that 500. You, you don't want to cheat and make that number larger just to account for a certain scenario because it's going to slow things down. So, you know, go back to the drawing board and rethink your, your strategy to where you can get at all the data and either use searching or filtering or some other type of formula strategy to deal with, you know, a large data set, 300 million, 30 million, right? Um, and only, you know, deal with it 500 items at a time, right? So, you know, if you're building a solution to where you need every item in the data source, you probably want to rethink your strategy on, um, to where, you know, you can deal within that 500 parameter. Because, you know, it's, it's just going to help you with, from performance um, in the long run. All right, so here I got Rolls Royce, which is um, further down in the list. And the one that we all want to confirm is Tesla. And we have that, Cybertruck, and all this other good stuff. And like I said, I like this solution because now what I can do is go to list settings. And, and if, I, if there's a new mate that I don't have, it's just a matter of adding the item here. Where is my hmm? make options? Did I click on the wrong list? I, nope. Make options. Oh, no, I'm in the car. Sorry. So now what I do is just go to my car maker list, car models list, hit options. And now we have a new maker. Uh, let's say Deshaun, the Deshaun, the Deshaun, right? And then, so I add my make there, and then I go to my car models. And that's the thing, like, you want to make sure you're building something that's doable. Now, one of the things I probably should do, right, is to um, make this probably 
refactor this list to where I don't sep I don't have these separate, right? So, you know, if, if I'm gonna have a mate drop down to store different options, maybe I should use that to specify the value as well, right? So so the Deshaun uh, ED2, right? So now if I go to my request, hit new without, you know, changing or republishing anything, I can select the shine and then my ED2. So it's, it's maintainable. And that's the thing, like, you know, when you come up with these cool different strategies and these creative ways to solve different problems, make sure it's maintainable, maintainable in the sense that the admin or the power user of this solution can add these different values and they're not calling, you know, you as the app maker to come back and add these values and republish the form and stuff like that. All right. Okay, so uh, that's it for this video. In the next video, what we want to do is tackle the new component feature uh, and then also take a look at how do you deal with multiple forms. I have a, a new strategy on multiple forms that I think would be very helpful and um, go from there. All right, any questions, uh, hit me up in the comments. And until then, I'll see you in the next video. All right, take care. <laughs> Thank you.